Thanks for the music, you guys. Awesome. <coughs> Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Look outside. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful sunshine out there? Isn't that beautiful? <coughs> I tell you, I think if, uh, if I just stood up here and spoke for a few minutes about uh, what we've already experienced this morning, uh, that would be a sermon, wouldn't it? Uh, so let's see, what did we hear? We heard about uh, uh, if angels were to select a vehicle to drive, it'd be a, 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 a convertible. Well, that's pretty cool. You didn't know that, did you? That was awesome. That was a great story, Julie. Um, what about uh, sing, singing a Christmas song uh, in, in April? Is that okay with everybody? Is that cool? Yeah, right? Well, there's a reason. Uh, we'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, every time I hear Jim Johnson uh, give Garden a prayer, it's, it's an incredible blessing. And uh, you, don't you sense the family coming together before the throne of God and asking for God's blessing upon our prayer requests and hearing our praises? Don't you hear it? Don't you feel it? You feel it. And that special music, uh, I, I have a request uh, for the church. From now on, we need to have tissues, boxes of tissues up here, all right? So I, I, I'm serious. Uh, I want the church to make sure that there are boxes of tissues up here, and especially right here and right over there. He is risen. He is resurrected. He's, I mean, um, that's, uh, that's why we're here. What he did for us. Uh, so, and of course the bells with hallelujah, wasn't that amazing? I wanted to share a couple things with you. Um, out in the uh, foyer there's the Kairos uh, calendar, and it, we're right in the middle of our spring campaign, so it's very busy. Kairos Prison Ministry International is an interdenominational ministry and there are three weekends going on right now uh, two of them are Kairos inside and so uh, there is a team of uh, uh, about 40 uh, men uh, in Plainfield Correctional Facility doing weekend number 20, uh, 20 uh, weekend number 20 and also in Pendleton they're also doing weekend number 20 so that's, and they'll be serving about 40 offenders and taking in chocolate chip cookies to everyone in the facility. So each one of those uh, small groups are taking in uh, about 2,400 dozen homemade chocolate chip cookies. Uh, and absolutely smothered in prayer immersed in prayer and uh, and then also we have a Kairos outside weekend going on which serves the women adult women of men who are incarcerated men or women who are incarcerated so if it's okay with you uh, since I've already uh, the, the, the concept of interactive prayer is amongst us already right let's have prayer right now I want to I want I want to tap into the energy of our of our church family for this right now uh, dear father in heaven I thank you so much for my church family this church home and I ask Lord uh, that all of our hearts would be united in praying for the two Kairos inside weekends and the Kairos outside weekend that lives will be moved, hearts will be changed, and lives will be dedicated to the glory of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Uh, one of the cool things about Kairos is that it allows me to uh, speak uh, behind the scenes because we don't speak about denominational specific items because it could be considered divisive. You know, we don't talk about uh, baptism uh, during the Kairos weekend. We don't talk about communion during Kairos weekend because different faiths have different viewpoints on that. But all the faiths believe in uh, the fact that Jesus came and lived a sinless life and died on a cross 
for forgiveness of sin. So, very powerful. So I appreciate that. But one of the side benefits of that is, is I get the opportunity to uh, share with Presbyterian pastors and Methodist pastors and lay people alike, uh, Catholics, and get an opportunity to share with them uh, the uniqueness of the Seventh-day Adventist message. And it's a real blessing. Uh, one of the uh, spinoffs is that on Monday nights I get to give a Bible study. And you guys have heard me go through the, the 10 points, you know, part 13, wow. That's all good stuff, right? One of the things that we say in there is um, that I hope you never get tired of hearing that each one of you, each one of us, is a unique, one-of-a-kind priceless treasure to the heart of God. Well, so uh, a couple Mondays ago, I was in there, it was, on, it was on my birthday. And so one of the things I do is I look up the guy's birth dates, right? And I keep a record of that. And so for the month of April, everybody in April, you know, we, we, we point out whose birthdays it is. And I've usually got somewhere between 30 and 40 men on the Monday night Bible study in the Putnamville Correctional Facility. That's a medium security uh, prison part of the Department of Corrections in the state of Indiana. And uh, uh, so last March, um, I added my name on the last uh, uh, night, Monday night that we were in there. And it happened to be my birthday, March 27th, in case you're making notes for, you know, uh, ex for your budget for next year. <laughs> but they gave me this card. They put this, I, I walked in there on Monday night and, you know, there was this big sign, you know, and happy birthday, Mr. Boo, uh, from your Monday night SDA Bible study class. Thank you for all you do. We love you. And so every night when I go in on Monday nights, I get uh, between 30 and 40 hugs. Uh, from these men and when when we're leaving after we've circled up and had prayer uh, another 35 to 40 hugs and um, I don't know what you think about how you serve God and and how you count your blessings and the treasures in heaven but uh, the number of hugs you're getting and giving uh, that's certainly a measure of of uh, God's blessing on your life so they gave me this card, too. It says, God created you one of a kind. Amazing. So the whole unique, one of a kind, priceless treasure message is getting through to these men. And they, they all signed it, wrote little notes and stuff. So there's, you know, do you think that's treasure in heaven? <clears throat> so I just thought that you would get a kick out of some of that. All right. So this is part 13. Anybody buying this? Part 13? Anybody, anybody getting this? Wow. Why is God worthy of worship? And we talk about the great controversy. I want to tell you, it's a little intimidating because um, I'm glad that we're, we have a loving church family. Because uh, the Sabbath school class, class lesson this morning, uh, Les ran that. You know, the Holy Spirit led through him. And man, did we have a great conversation. Your comments were awesome. Uh, I mean, th just a different, the different comments. Uh, David, both of you guys, I mean, it was awesome. What you guys shared was, you know, I mean, it was so insightful and spiritually mature. And it fed my soul. It fed my very being the conversation that we had and you know uh, I, in the Kairos ministry I tell folks you know uh, I tell those guys I said every minute that you are in prayer for someone else is a minute that you are not stressed or worried over your own life a healthy distraction right just a healthy distraction every minute that you are praying for someone else is a minute that you're not focused on oh poor little me I'm going to go over the corner and eat a can of worms Coming to Sabbath school class this morning, you know, it takes time and it takes energy. You got you to you, you get up and you got to come. You know, you know, I drive an hour to get here. And boy, I tell you what, I'm just stressing because I, somehow I slept on my alarm clock and, and I'm, I'm like driving here, you know, breaking the law in five counties just to get here, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I'm worried because I'm going to miss Tony's opening songs. 
op miss the opening so song service, you know, and he only usually sings two or three songs. I get in on the last song, you know. I'm coming in. I'm trying to put something on the Kairos bulletin board, and, and you know, uh, Tony's doing blessing assurance. I'm, I'm out there going blessing assurance. I'm posting this thing, you know, making sure I don't poke myself. Um, to draw closer to Christ is to, to lift our minds you know, conscientiously, lift our minds so to spend ourselves, you know, spend ourselves in time with, with, with folks of like belief. We don't always get along. Maybe, maybe sometimes we get our feelings hurt. But if we're in this, if we're in this environment, we're in this atmosphere of worship, in this atmosphere of loving God and, and, and listening to people talk about how they know God loves them. So I tell you, uh, to get up here and be able to speak, I'm very thankful that we have a loving church family because I have, I have nothing really new to share other than what we've already had today. You're thinking I'm done. <laughs> Sorry. That ain't going to happen. Chris is over here going, yes. I hope they got potluck ready. Oh. Uh, but because it's intimidating, uh, the, the, the spiritual maturity of what we heard in Sabbath school class this morning, uh, and, what, and this is typical. It's not just this morning. Uh, the Sabbath school class and the spiritual bolstering uh, the foundation, the strength. I mean, polishing the armor, uh, breathing the atmosphere of heaven. Uh, in this church family, in Sabbath school, is uh, uh, it establishes me. It helps me to understand the language of Christianity. It helps me to understand why we need the Holy Spirit. It helps me to understand what this language of Christianity, the gold tried in the fire, it helps me to understand girding the loins. Man, we heard some stuff about girding the loins this morning. I, that was, I mean, that meant a lot to me. I used to play uh, music in ro weekend rock bands. And, uh, and was a pretty rotten dude. And the last thing I want to do is glorify any of that because it led to a lot of bad behavior. Behavior, one, that I do not want to glorify, and two, I do not really want you guys to be, to be exposed to. So uh, we talked about uh, this morning in Scabba School, we talked about victory. And we talked about, there was a passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. And that whole thing about, about uh, who was it that said that? I, I don't see that fellow in here anymore. Who? Uh, uh, older fellow just lost his wife in January? Huh? He had to leave? Mark? You know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just theology. It was the theology of the heart of God. And we shared on a very personal level. That is the winning combination to bolstering confidence, uh, bolstering relationship with Christ. Okay, so um, I have uh, confused notes here. No, here it is. Uh, you guys know that I like to start with... Uh, uh, Sister Ellen, um, in the seven-point cycle, we're on uh, number 13, so that means we're on uh, number six of the uh, second cycle of seven, and this has to do with humanity. Uh, this, this particular grouping of seven in our series uh, deals with uh, uh, promises. We're focused on promises. But just because we move out of this grouping of seven doesn't mean the promises should not always be a part of what we are experiencing in our daily lives. So, regardless of what you're seeing, what you're watching, who you're talking to, what you're hearing, think of how does this apply with the promises of God? What promise of God do I have uh, uh, embedded in my heart, in my being, in my very soul, does this would apply here? How can I help this person? Or what is it that God is sharing with me? So, uh, item six... Uh, following the mechanisms of biblical numerology has to do with man. So that's why the title is called Humanity, the Praises. I mean the Promises, okay? The Promises. 
So we are going to deal with uh, humanity, our weakness. And uh, Jim and I were talking, you know, about, you know, the humility that God gives us. And, and sometimes we just don't feel, you know, worthy to do what he's calling us to do sometimes. And uh, that's, that's a healthy sense of humility. But step up anyway. Step up anyway. Don't worry about, you know, just whatever your strengths and weaknesses. Step out and do it anyway. God will bless. We leave the blessing to God. You know, look at the people in this room. Here we are in our sanctuary. We believe that we are surrounded by angels. There are, uh, there's a whole parking lot full of convertibles out there. What? What's he saying? Parking lot full of convertibles? Did I get a new car? Okay, you got to listen. You got to pay attention. Uh, so we're, the room is filled with angels. Our hearts, our sanctuary has been lifted up as a group and individually. And our hearts are in the very throne room of God. The very throne room of God. Our, our beings are being fused with the very essence of the love and the character of God. So that we can share with others. Isn't that the reason? Okay. Uh, Jasmine and I sang this song, uh, I don't know, it was about a month ago. And uh, it was based on our uh, opening uh, verse. And it's been a, one of my favorite for years, uh, Isaiah 53, 11. And uh, uh, this song has, I mean, really moved me when they asked me to do this. And so, you know, I put this in a, in a sermon months ago. And, but, of course, they did the song, months, you know, a couple of years before that, I think. But uh, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And that's right in the heart of that whole context, the last third of Isaiah 52 and all of Isaiah 52. Which is the messianic uh, 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 message of, of Isaiah. Uh, it's really the heart of it. And uh, Jesus shall see the fruits of what he has done, and he shall be satisfied. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. We talked this morning in Sabbath school about what motivates you. What gets you going? What motivates you? Why do you come to church? Why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Jesus Christ? Why do you declare the Bible as your rule of faith? This is my worldview. Yes, streets of gold, mansion, mansion on a hill. Amen. Hallelujah. That's great. You know, grapes the size of... Okay, never mind. Uh, whatever. Uh, it's going to be great. And then there's the motivation that, that uh, God is worthy. God reveals Himself. God wants us to know that He loves us. And there's the idea that anything that I might say or think or do would glorify Jesus. Bring glory to His name throughout the universe. That's pretty powerful motivation. So this level of motivation, knowing that all that we say and do, everything, the, the result, there'll be many lost and, and some saved. Jesus will see that fruit and He shall be satisfied. To me, that's very powerful. Okay, so I'd like to start with, uh, 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 this is actually taken from an article by Vance Farrell. Uh, and this is several, um, so bear with me, okay, so I'm going to do some reading here. Stick with me. This has to do with the nature of Christ. And so, bear with me. Some of you may not agree, but these are statements from Ellen White, and I'm going to share them with you. This may be the last message I give. I don't know. May, may. <laughs> Here we go. You ready? Listen. 
Christ is the ladder that Jacob saw. If that ladder had failed by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. But Christ reaches us where we are. He took our nature and overcame that we, through taking His nature, might overcome. Amen. It took the divine and the human to bring into the world the salvation that was needed by fallen man. Christ fully human, fully divine. Any arguments? All good? Christ took our nature in its deteriorated condition. These are statements from the prophet of God. Last day's prophet. He took upon him our nature that he might reach man in his fallen condition. He assumed human nature that he might elevate the human family. That's why he did it. Isn't that really the reason why he's worthy of worship? The why Jesus did what he did? Every temptation that could be brought against fallen humanity, he met and overcame. Had he not been fully human, he could not have been our substitute. Christ took upon Himself our infirmities, and in the weakness of humanity, He needed to seek strength from His Father. How did Jesus overcome? By seeking the strength from His Father. Here He lived as a man among men, meeting the temptations that we must meet, and overcoming through strength from above. By His sinless life, He demonstrated that through the power of God, it is possible for man to withstand Satan's temptations. So this is kind of the theology, the, the idea of not glorifying the sins of our past. That's a practical thing, right? We need to learn these practical things. More on that as time goes on. That's so important. This is real. This is the science of overcoming. He suffered every phase of trial and temptation with which humanity is beset. He had all the strength of the passion of humanity. Um, I have all the citations, so uh, if, I'm just avoiding those just for the sake of time, okay? And, and to get through these and show a cohesiveness between these uh, multiple snippets. Uh, I have them if anybody needs them, okay? But many say that Jesus was not like us. That He was not as we are in the world. That He was divine, divine, and therefore we cannot overcome as He overcame. But this is not true. For verily, He took not upon Himself the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham, which is from Hebrews 2.16. He took upon Himself our nature. The plan of salvation... Required that Christ, who is fully God, become fully man. And in our fallen nature, live a perfectly clean, sinless life. Hallelujah. His sacrificial death on Calvary and His mediation in the sanctuary above provide the atonement by which we may be saved. For from heaven, Jesus provides His followers with enabling grace so they too can obey the Father's law, just as Jesus did while on earth. That's pretty powerful. Many claim that it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. That he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have in any sense a more trying conflict than Christ had, then he would not be able to secure us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. As Jesus was in human nature, so God means his followers to be. The Savior took upon Himself the infirmities of humanity, and on this earth lived a sinless life that men should have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature they would not be able to overcome. So there, so then uh, Elder Pharaoh uh, talks about what he just quoted here. He says, So there is the glorious truth of the human nature of Christ. Can you see how it is a bedrock truth? A truth the entire atonement, atonement is based upon? If Christ did not take our nature, if the latter did not reach all the way, we would be hopelessly lost. We could not be saved. We could not go to heaven. 
<clears throat> that gives me great hope that uh, Jesus gave us uh, the example of overcoming. And I don't know how in the world, you know, when you look at the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 through 3, you know, it all has this formula, right? There's this formula. You put all seven of them beside, of course, in a spreadsheet, right? Does anybody doubt that I've got that in a spreadsheet? <laughs> <laughs> it's color coded. Oh yeah, it's most definitely color coded. And uh, so, so all seven letters. And you know, there's something different about the seventh. Uh, to him that overcometh, even as I also overcame. That has to do with spiritual maturity. There is a spiritual maturity uh, uh, for those of us in the last days, those who are Adventists, there's this spiritual maturity uh, that says, I will overcome by His grace just the way Jesus overcame by His Father's grace. Okay. All right. Um, there are some uh, Adventist pastors out today that are speaking this kind of message. Um, if, you've, if you're taking notes, uh, Larry Kirkpatrick is one. Dennis Preby is one. Russell and Colin Standish, uh, those guys, their books, talk about those kind of things. So if you're interested, uh, great YouTube presentations. All right. So here we go. Uh, interactive sermon. I have seven texts that we will look up and we will pray together to the throne room of God. Everybody okay with that? We're going to have interactive prayer, interactive sermon with God. So you don't have to interact with me. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to look at these passages and we're going to uh, pray to the throne room of God over these verses together. All right. Let's go to our uh, Opening text, Isaiah 53. Isaiah is the first of the major prophets. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Isaiah 53. And so when I'm given the Bible study on Monday nights, I, I like the guys to touch their Bibles, move through the Bibles, learn, understand how to find things on their own. Because in reality, you don't need any man to teach you. You get the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit, and in prayer, uh, all truth is available to all mankind. Isaiah 53 and uh, verse 11 he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Hallelujah. So we will uh, praise God. We will, uh, we will take this as a promise that he has um, justified us by his knowledge, by an understanding of who he is, and by what he has presented. So I like to put my hand right on the verse. This is practical, uh, this is practical Christianity, okay? Uh, putting my hand on the verse doesn't do anything. It's, it's not like some sort of voodoo mystery thing, right? We're not superstitious in this room. It's just a symbol. Okay, so I will say a short prayer, and then I will give you time to say your short prayer. And if for some reason I interrupt you, you just keep on saying your prayer, because that's much more important to me than for you to hear what I have to say. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are in this place with us now, that you have lifted us up out of our daily cares, and you have brought us here to worship you. And now, Father, I would just ask that you accept my praise. I thank you, Lord. Help me to understand the truth that Jesus um, will be satisfied and that he has justified us. Lord, bless us now, I pray.
Amen. Hallelujah. So listen, uh, I've heard uh, some some uh, pastors and elders and conference leadership folk uh, in Adventist Church talk about, well, you know, we've been thinking about maybe we need to change a little bit how we have worship service on a Sabbath. Um, and I, I guess I, you know, prayed about that some, and, and so that's where this whole kind of this kind of concept came up with the idea of lifting us our, our lifting us up and being aware that we're surrounded by angels and that the Holy Spirit is in this place that we are actually in the throne room of God that when we are praying uh, to God that that's uh, what's happening um, Romans chapter 8 verse 3 we'll go to the New Testament this is Paul's letter to the Romans and of course uh, you can uh, really talk uh, a, a whole sermon about the last half of uh, Romans 7 and how it goes into Romans 8. And I can tell you there is much confusion among the evangelical world about the last... And uh, the idea of uh, Paul's inner des description of a Christian's inner conflict uh, about accepting the truth and, and finding conversion... If you read those those last pass those last verses in seven and take that section where he's wrestling with God uh, and count the number of times it refers to me or I and you count the number of times it refers to the Holy Spirit or God or Jesus and then you take the next section uh, of, of Romans chapter eight which is answering all that you know I thank God you know Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ and then you, you count the same things the number of times it refers to I me that's probably in a spreadsheet somewhere too I me, etc. Uh, and then you take how many times it counts, you know, it says God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and you see a, a pattern that happens there. But that's not what we're here for. Romans chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 3. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That's worthy of, uh, of, 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 of uh, recognizing that as a promise to us. So I'm going to put my hand right there. I'm going to say a short prayer, and then you guys say your short prayer. Dear Father, let me understand this truth of how You sent Your Son and how he overcame uh, the way I am to overcome. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's move to Hebrews. Just don't you love the book of Hebrews? We love it all. Let's look at Hebrews uh, chapter 2. Hebrews, that's one of your favorites, isn't it, Chris? Yeah. We love the book of Hebrews, especially uh, Hebrews 11. You know, when you try to, when you try to con break down the walls uh, about dispensationalism as a, a theology, uh, Hebrews 11 goes a long way. Because all the Old Testament's uh, uh, heroes of faith, they were saved by faith, not by the blood of animals or by, by works. Amen? Hebrews 2. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. And it sounds like this. I don't think Jesus has anything against convertibles. But here we go. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. And if I'm misspelling any of those, if I'm mispronouncing any of those words, uh, I'm sure God will give you guys some grace for me, right? Is that okay? Secure, sucker. You say tomato, I say tomato. Okay. All right. Let's, let's pray over this. Is that okay with you guys? Let's do that right here. 
Dear Father, there's so much in this passage uh, about how Jesus condescended himself for me. And I am thankful. My heart is lifted up because of it. And how he did it so he could be merciful and faithful, a high priest for me, that he might reconcile me to you. And that he was tempted in all points like me, but he never sinned. And he is my hero, and I'm thankful. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's see. That was number three. How about number four? <clears throat> oh, yeah, here we go. Let's have a Christmas passage, maybe. Isaiah 9, 6. We're going back to Isaiah. That's the first of the uh, major prophets. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And uh, so this is a you know classic Christmas verse, but it's good all year round. Why not sing a Christmas song in April? Is that okay? Yeah, right on. Okay, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Everybody there? Good Christians now rejoice. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it goes on. But I think the point there is, let's talk about this thing just, just briefly about the name. You know, when we, when we close out a prayer in the name of Christ, um, we're talking about the character of God. Right? Aren't we? Anytime we refer to the name of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the character of God that is worthy of worship for all eternity. Every time you say, in Jesus' holy name, amen. When you say that, you're talking about a desire to be like Him. You're talking about why God is worthy of worship for all eternity. It's about that three pounds of flesh between our ears, right? It's about choice. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Here we are. <clears throat> Child is born. Son is given. Uh, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the promise that he is a wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God. Your son, Jesus, is the everlasting father, the prince of peace. We give you all the thanks and honor and glory. In Jesus' name. On the very character of God. Amen. Uh, bounce back to Hebrews chapter 2. I guess if I warned you, then you would have been able to put your hand there, right? Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> and now we will continue. Actually, this is a, a precursor to verses 16 to 18 that we read earlier. We're going to look at uh, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, and that is the devil. Devil means accuser. Satan means adversary. How we share our faith with others and the language we use and how we bring the Spirit into it are all very important. Okay, I'm going to say a prayer over this. Thank you, God, for the promise that Jesus' life and death 
and resurrection and ministry in heaven destroy the power of your accuser and your adversary. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, folks, just two more. And we'll do... Uh, uh, the last two are kind of combined together, so it'll be easy. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we bounce back through the T's. Philippians 2, and I'll just read these very, very familiar verses. We'll start with verse 5. Verse 5 is actually one of my daily memory verses. Uh, but we'll read verses 5 through 8. You know, uh, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, this is uh, uh, another one of those practical aspects of that a tool that God has given us in the, in the plan of salvation. I'm going to read verses two, uh, 5 through 8. And uh, we will focus on verse 8 and then verse 5 in reverse order. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. When the Bible says let, when, God, when the Bible is talking about God speaking and He says let, all you got to do is get out of the way and it happens. The only thing, the only power in all the universe that can thwart God when He says let is my free will. Everything else is out of the way. Principalities, powers of darkness, uh, powers in high places, all those things have no chance. If God says, let there be light, darkness runs away. So if God says, let this mind be in you, the only thing keeping the mind from Christ from being in you is you, is your choice. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, who was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, death, even the death of the cross. That's worthy of, a, of, of a, uh, uh, taking that, claiming that as a promise and also as a praise. We'll start with verse 8. Uh, Dear God, thank you for the condescension of Christ once again. Lord, it sounds like we sound like a broken record this morning, Lord. Our hearts are humbled that Jesus would humble himself. Even the death of the cross for my sins. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. If you're still praying, keep praying. Don't let me stop you. And we'll bounce back up to verse 5 and we'll close out with this. Uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. All right. Uh, let's pray over this together as a church family. Then we'll have our closing hymn. Listen, folks. Um, it's so easy to get bogged down in the quagmire of life. Non-stop, constantly, everything seems like... But we need to live lives that are as Sabbatarians, full of rest in Christ. The rest, and we need to be, we need all of it. We need that peace. So let's, let's uh, encourage each other to uh, pray for each other and um, seek all opportunities that God gives us to share the truth of Jesus Christ. That is the power of Jesus Christ is the story of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your holy scriptures. And I thank you, Lord, that all I have to do is choose you every moment of the day. 
And I will be transformed into the likeness of, of your son Jesus and be fit for heaven and the a company of holy angels for all eternity. Lord, you are worthy of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Happy Sabbath.